Well, part of our museum does include a small electronic collection from the very earliest uh, transistor, I'm sorry, the crystal radios, uh, on up through vacuum tubes and so forth. Here you see a few ham radios. I got my interest in around 1950 or a little earlier when I was about uh, 12 years old, maybe even in 48 when I was 10, I had a crystal radio. When I was 14 years old, 15 years old, I, 1954, I um, got my first amateur radio license. So I've been an amateur radio operator for 61 years. This radio right here is a 1939 receiver, very similar to one of the first ones I used. There were a number of companies involved here, some early Heathkit 1960-some uh, radios. And like I said, we have a, just a variety of radios in our collection. We're not really a real serious radio collector, but I do have them. And this one is of particular interest. This is a uh, marine radio transmitter made by Conell. And what's interesting to me is my first job out of college, I worked for this company. Sidney Konigsberg was a wonderful fellow. He hired me to run his production department. I'd worked for him a couple of summers in the late uh, part of my college career. So I have no particular interest in this radio other than it reminds me of my first job out of college for Conell Electronics. I was production manager for marine radio transmitters. Um, Many things happened because of amateur radio. It sort of led my career in electronics. Uh, because I had a radio license, I was able to join the Navy a few ranks up, became second class, third class petty officer, and then came out and went to college. And uh, all the jobs I've had, I would say the extra training I got being an amateur radio operator was a, a real advantage. We started traveling a lot internationally, and even for Virginia Tech, where I was a teacher for 33 years. The last 10 years we did international work for the university, traveling to various universities, and we always used ham radio as the entry into other universities. It was very interesting. My personal call is KK4WW, and in the early 90s we were traveling, we realized that we'd have much more effect if we had a foundation, a more official kind of thing to do goodwill work. So we started the Foundation for Amateur International Radio Service in 1992, been uh, running that foundation for 23 years. We still have lots of active projects, particularly in the Ukraine, South America, Bangladesh, down in the Caribbean. In fact, we'll be traveling to visit some of our members uh, in about two weeks down in Dominica, where we're furnish uh, radios for disaster communications. We have an amateur radio station here in the museum, and a uh, very effective radio station. Our, our foundation call is N4USA, N4USA, that's the call for our radio foundation. And we can operate from here. We have three radio stations. We have one here in the museum, we have one at home, and we have one out at our farm, at Chantilly Farm. All very nice operating stations, and we use them quite frequently, and we have a lot of guest operators as well. Now that's the uh, logo for our Ferris Foundation, Foundation for Amateur International Radio Service. Our mission statement is promoting goodwill through amateur radio. And we've been doing that for 22 years or more. And I've had some fascinating trips into the Soviet Union while it was still the Soviet Union. We traveled there after the breakup of the Soviet Union and we did a lot of uh, promoting over there, including uh, getting computers and radios into some of our friends there. And, Ham radio and amateur radio has just been a fascinating thing, and it's been a one-up for us on many things. Even the museum here, um, it gives us a one-up. A lot of ham radio people are interested in computers, and they love to come in here and see the computers and use the radio station and talk amateur radio and computers. So amateur radio is still a big part of my life, and I enjoy it very much.